effect and how it always fell across the lamina cribrosa. We could calculate the pressure gradient, that is the pressure drop per millimetre of tissue in the animals. And typically it was about 25 millimetres of mercury per millimetre of tissue. And it more than doubled when the intraocular pressure increased to 28 millimetres of mercury. That's compared to intraocular pressure of 16. Um, so the, and also the translaminar pressure gradient in the dogs was about 45 millimetres of mercury per millimetre of tissue when the intraocular pressure was about 25. The reason for mentioning that figure is that other people using rabbit sciatic nerve had found that this was about the gradient at which axonal transport was affected by a pressure gradient. Oh, I'll go back. So the, kit, the critical uh, factor determining the pressure gradient was the difference between intraocular pressure and CSF pressure. And this is just that image again with some figures now. We now knew that the um, I've got 30 millimetres of mercury here. I'll, I'll explain why I've got that figure in a minute and I'll show you the human results. What we did um, was we looked at the human uh, lamina cribrosa and the pia mater of the optic nerve, compared that to the dog and then did a rough calculation of what the human translaminar pressure gradient in the normal situation would be. So in the human is a bit different to the dog. You have a, what we call a glial lamina cribrosa where the tissue is mainly glia. And then you have the collagen or the connective tissue lamina cribrosa, which is really what we talk about when we say lamina cribrosa. It's the connective tissue from the collagen. So the, when you calculate it over that, you got about 30 millimetres of mercury per millimetre across the collagenous or scleral lamina cribrosa in the normal human. Although if you included the, the glial lamina, then we would calculate about 20 millimetres of mercury per millimetre. So obviously we can't do those pipette experiments in the human eye, but we take it that the typical gradient in the human is somewhere between these two figures. And also that the likely retrolaminal pressure that in this part of the nerve is about five millimetres of mercury. Okay, so that's a lot of theory and I'm sorry I put you through that. The, what are the practical outcomes? Well, Joss Jonas measured the lamina thickness in a group of patients' eyes with either normal or glaucoma and also some myopic patients found that the typical uh, lamina thickness was about 460 or 500 microns in thickness. And this was the collagenous lamina. However, in the glaucoma, it was thinned, it was, com it was compressed down and to about 200 microns, so about half, if you like, which means that the pressure drop or the pressure gradient fell across a much shorter distance. And so, our estimate here, if we look, take a conservative approach in the normal human would be about 20 millimetres of mercury per millimetre, but increasing in the normal, um, in, in the typical severe glaucoma patient to about 46 millimetres of mercury per millimetre, even when the intraocular pressure was just 15. And it's a lot worse in patients with high myopia so if you look at the figures down here, you'll see that in a glaucoma group of high myopic eyes, the typical lamina thickness is say 80 or perhaps 100 microns, which is about half of that in the uh, typical severe glaucoma that's not myopic. And in the normal myopic eye, so the ones that don't have glaucoma, the high myopes, the lamina is already half the thickness of the absolutely normal subjects. So about 200 microns compared to about 450. So the myopes 
have a thin lamina and the pressured gr gradient has to drop over that much shorter distance anyway, even if they don't have glaucoma. So let's plot some numbers, look at it graphically. So what does all this mean? If we were to imagine your typical patient that you see in the clinic who has an intraocular pressure of 15 and a CSF pressure of zero at eye level, and so the retrolaminar tissue pressure is about five, then the gradient would fall across the lamina and the typical gradient would be about 20 millimetres of mercury. If that pressure, eye pressure rises to 25, then the gradient would become much steeper, basically double to 40 millimetres of mercury per millimetre. Okay, so over time, there'll be some damage done to that nerve, but the glaucoma takes a long time to be diagnosed. As, as, I, as I explained, the time until you get a definite field defect, you've probably lost half of your nerve tissue already, and you will have compressed the lamina cribrosa somewhat. So let's say the patient is not diagnosed until the lamina cribrosa has gone from 500 microns down to about 250 microns. And here you'll see that the gradient goes from 40 millimetres of mercury per millimetre up to a very large 80 millimetres of mercury per millimetre. That's before they're diagnosed. Let's suppose they're diagnosed and we treat them with timolol or a, a latanoprost or something and we reduce the pressure from 25 down to 15. So you can see now the gradient is reduced, but it's still working over a thinner lamina. So we can't, the lamina has squashed down and whatever we do, we can't re-expand it because we don't have the technology, we don't have the treatment to do that. So the gradient in the pre-treated, so the untreated patient is high at 80 millimetres of mercury. We treat the patient, we get the pressure down to 15 and we think, wow, we've done a great job, pressure's 15, uh, that's normal. However, the gradient is still elevated at 40 millimetres of mercury. So it's still about double uh, what the normal pressure gradient would be. So that patient is still at some risk of getting worse, unfortunately. And we see this all the time. Let's talk about the gradients. Do they actually matter? This is an example of a, a, a water gradient falling down a waterfall. Now, the gradients affect the pressure distribution in the axons and the nerves, also the connective tissue, also the veins in particular as the veins leave the back of the eye. So here, one of our uh, young doctors did this lovely research some years ago, looking at the histology of the endothelial cells lining the arteries and the veins in the centroidal artery, centroidal vein, going down the optic nerve and looked at the shape or the morphology. And this is typical arterial endothelial cell, which is kind of like a spindle that's long and spindly shaped. Now, normally the veins endothelial cells are slightly irregular. We call them polygonal. You can see here, that's the prelaminar layer. This is the anterior lamina. That's that glial lamina that we talked about. Here is the retrolaminar. So you can see it's thicker, more chunky. But in the lamina zone, so as the veins passing through the lamina cribrosa, it's very much a spindle shape. So very much like the artery. And that's almost certainly because the vein is being subject to very high gradient and very high velocity of flow, just like the artery is. <clears throat> so there's some indirect evidence that the gradient indeed is going down uh, at worst in the lamina region. Also, it's having an effect even in the normal people on the tissue within the lamina cribrosa. Now, oh, oh, sorry, I can't show you this. I should have linked it up. Now, uh, I can try actually. 
No, I can't, sorry. Um, this is uh, work which shows the mitochondria being transported back and forth along a nerve. And that's happening all the time in the ganglion cell axons. Now, I mentioned this other work which showed that the axonal transport is inhibited or slowed down greatly by a pressure gradient of around about 45 millimetres of mercury per millimetre. So that slows down the transport of vital uh, vesicles like mitochondria, but also vital transmitters like a brain derived neurotrophic factor, which comes back from the thalamus in the brain into the eye to basically stimulate the ganglion cells and send them a message to say that everything's okay, don't die. Whereas if you cut the nerve, you stop that transport backwards and that sends that lack of message going back to the ganglion to the body tells the cell to die. Uh, that's what is basically happening in glaucoma uh, and it is largely due to axonal transport interruption. This is work done by Dr. Balaratnasingham in our laboratory some years ago and <clears throat> showing the axonal transport. So you can see the stain within the axons passing well back in, this is in pigs with a normal intraocular pressure, but how it's held up in the lamina region in pigs with pressure of about 43. This is what we call cytochrome oxidase staining. It's an, a marker of mitochondrial activity and the denser the stain, the more active the mitochondria are. So in the normal eye, there is a bit more mitochondrial activity in the lamina zone. You can see how it's a bit more brown here, certainly more brown than in the retrolamina region and a little bit more brown than in the prelamina region. But if you elevate the intraocular pressure to 43, then you get very marked activity because these mitochondria are feeding all of those little motors that move things up and down and they have to work hard going uphill against that gradient. <clears throat> so I thought, so th they're direct effects of the gradient on both the blood vessel, the veins and the axons, but also you get direct effects on the connective tissue, which supports all of the structures. This is some work looking at the movement of the surface of the optic disc in dogs measured by uh, confocal tomography or HRT machine. And the green is where the tissue is moving towards you. The red is where it's moving away. And the baseline pressure was 14 and a half, CSF pressure of zero. If we reduce intraocular pressure, the tissue moves towards you. If you increase intraocular pressure, it gets pushed away. Pushed away. <laughs> Sorry, that's when it moves towards you. It gets pushed away. It gets pushed away. Um, the same sort of thing happens if you alter CSF pressure. So if you start with a CSF pressure of one, increase it by just one and a half millimeters of mercury, you'll see how the tissue gets pushed towards you. And then if you increase it, the CSF pressure even more, the tissue gets pushed closer to you. So the optic nerve is acting a little bit like a, a diaphragm or like a speaker cone. It's responding to the pressure difference. The connective tissue, if it's pushed too hard one way or the other way, it will start to compress and uh, shrivel, get pushed together. That's why the lamina thins over time in glaucoma. So this is just graphing the movement of the optic nerve in relation to the difference between intraocular pressure and CSF pressure. Now you will notice that most of the movement occurs uh, between a, a gradient of zero or a pressure difference of zero and a pressure difference of about 15. And that once you go beyond 15, you don't get much more movement of the optic nerve. So 
That's an interesting result because there was an old theory for glaucoma which suggested that it was movement of the nerve that caused kinking and distortion, like uh, kinking of the axons, and that led to their damage. But most of the movement is occurring in this pressure range, which is actually the normal pressure range. And we know that in this rather low pressure range, glaucoma is very unlikely. Whereas in this pressure range, where the pressure is a lot higher, we're getting damage. So it's not actually movement of the nerve that kills the axons. It's the stress pull, stretching the axons and also impeding axonal transport. People have modelled the stresses and the strains and virtually all of the models, whether you look at stress, which is like the force distribution modelled, or strain, which is like how the tissue is pulled apart, or if you look at even fluid velocities predicted within the axons themselves, they all show that most of the stress occurs in this part of the optic nerve. So this region, very peripheral and anterior lamina region. That's interesting because that's the very part that seems to distort the most in advanced glaucoma, where you get excavation, almost pushing the nerve outwards towards the termination of the optic nerve subarachnoid space. So that helps to explain why we get that cupping backwards and excavation. So just more recently, some work has found that uh, you're more likely to have normal tension glaucoma if your intracranial pressure is low compared to less likely to have glaucoma if your intracranial pressure is in the sort of normal range, say 13 compared to nine. And that was done in a retrospective study, a prospective study coming out of China 10 years ago, found the same result um, where the uh, normal pressure glaucoma patients tended to have a lower CSF pressure or intracranial pressure than the control group who have. So that gave some evidence to support the idea that CSF pressure is also important in patients with glaucoma. The problem is we just can't measure it without use doing a lumbar puncture, and we're not going to do that on every patient. That's, that's for sure. Now I'm going to uh, show you some slides on CSF pressure. They're a bit theoretical. This is measurements of the, we ran the pipette into the optic nerve subarachnoid space. And at the same time, we had the cannula in the brain measuring lateral ventricle pressure. So you'll see here, when I set the um, lateral ventricle pressure to very low, so minus eight millimeters of mercury, the optic nerve subarachnoid space pressure didn't fall any lower than zero. But when I, we could plot those around the back of the eye in the fat and the soft tissue is probably about zero millimeters of mercury. And you can't really force, I'll explain to you why, you can't force optic nerve subarachnoid space pressure to go less than orbital pressure. The other complicating factor is that the retro lamina tissue pressure isn't always equal to the optic nerve subarachnoid space pressure. And you can see here, it does follow, this is the black triangles, this is retro lamina pressure, until you reach about four or five millimetres of mercury, at which point it doesn't change very much at all. So again, there's another buffer. And we actually measured that. We found that that was due to the pia mater. So the pia mater is acting a bit like a, a sausage skin, com compressing the retro lamina nerve to some degree. And it's giving an extra buffer to, uh, to ward off or prevent you from having a very low pressure in this part of the nerve. So it counterbalances to some extent the higher pressure in the eye itself. So you've got two buffering capacities. You have the orbit, 
and the Pia Mater. That now the orbit remains hypothetical. We haven't measured that. We're actually going to start doing some more pig experiments in the next few months to try and measure that pressure in relation to um, subarachnoid space and intracranial pressure. This is simply the gradient of pressure across the Pia Mater. Now, this, this graph, or rather this schematic diagram is worth trying to understand. This is what our model is at the moment. It's a so-called four compartment model. So if you imagine there's a pressure in the cranium and that's easily measured by your lateral ventricle pressure. There's a pressure around the eye, the orbital pressure, which is actually very hard to measure. There's the intraocular pressure, which you can easily measure with an applanation tonometry, for example. There is the pressure in the optic nerve subarachnoid space. That's also very difficult to measure. You need a micro pipette and it's technically very difficult. You have the pia mater acting like a sausage skin as well. So here, this is the situation when you have your CSF pressure in the cranium, so your lateral ventricle pressure being greater than your orbital pressure. Basically, it's pushing fluid into the subarachnoid space pressure, into the subarachnoid space. So then that's really dominating the optic nerve subarachnoid space. And that's why the two pressure pressures remain equal. However, when you sit, for example, the CSF pressure falls in the around the brain. You get this uh, drop in lateral ventricle and CSF pressure in the cranium. And in a sense, it sucks out the fluid from the subarachnoid space. The orbital pressure, which will generally be probably zero or higher, will tend to uh, compress or collapse the dura onto the pia mater. And so you'll end up with little pockets of fluid remaining in the subarachnoid space of the optic nerve. And those that pressure will be roughly equivalent to orbital tissue pressure, most likely. So that's probably why you have that buffering effect. Now you're probably wondering why I'm talking all about this. Uh, we see a lot of elder, elderly people with glaucoma and I'm sure you would notice the same thing. Many of our older patients have very sunken eyes and that's because their orbital fat has atrophied over time. And it means that their orbital tissue pressure is going to be quite low. It's going to be subatmospheric, for example. Um, and that this is actually made worse by some drugs, particularly by Mataprost, perhaps some of the other prostaglandins. Mm -hmm. So it's worth thinking about this if you see older patients with orbital atrophy, for example, are you doing them a favor by putting them on uh, by Mataprost in particular, and perhaps the other prostaglandins. And it's interesting, if you operate on them, do a drainage procedure, often their orbits will start to thicken up. And you may be, in fact, benefiting, improving their buffering, pressure buffering capacity around the optic nerve. We don't have absolute proof for this hypothesis, uh, but hopefully we may do in the next few years. So I'm going to, I'm just not sure what the time is actually, Verna. Uh, I'll probably talk for long, I suspect. The, the, key, the key points for this. Yep. Um, well, what's going We've got a gas leak happening. The key points from this talk are that the intraocular pressure and the CSF pressure both together, so it's the difference between the two mostly, determine the stress on the nerve, the energy that all the nerve fibers have to use, and the axonal transport sort of ease, as well as some effects upon the blood vessels and the connective tissues. Now, that's actually modulated. The effect of CSF pressure is modulated by pia mater and the orbital tissue uh, pressure. It's also worth noting that the pia mater itself probably becomes thinner and weaker as you get older. 
which also may affect that sort of that pressure buffering capacity. The laminar cribrosa properties influence the shape of that risk pressure curve that I showed you at the beginning. So if you have a thin lamina, your risk pressure curve probably increases. It becomes, sorry, I'm not, I'm not drawing it very, it, from this, it would become steeper. And we don't have any way of making the curve go back down. All we can try and do is slide the pressure down the curve or try and stop it from getting even worse. Um, now, it, it is possible that in the future, we may be able to have certain drugs that make the axons more resilient. And those drugs are generally termed the neuroprotective agents. Unfortunately, none of the clinical trials that have ever been done to date have shown them to actually work. Uh, we've actually been testing a drug in some pig animal models, looking at uh, cytoskeleton and axons. I mean, one has found recently uh, seems to cause some protection of the cytoskeletal proteins uh, in pigs with high intraocular pressure, but it's it's far too early to speculate on whether that's going to be useful clinically. Um, so I'm going to stop here, Aunt Vernon. I think I don't think I've got any more slides. No, finished. Um, and basically open up for questions. And I'm going to try and stop sharing as well. Here we go. Thanks very much, Vernon. Uh, thank you, Professor Morgan. So we actually we have uh, some uh, question, Prof, in the chat room. Oh, right. Let's have a look. I'll see. Chat. Yes. Oh, we yes. have lots of questions. Yes. Do you want me to go through those, Verna? Yes, Rob, if you, if you want to. So from Anissa Wikisono, uh, you are emphasizing the pressure. Oh, hang on. The, the first one is from Dadang, Prof. DDG. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. No, no, from Vidya Anindita. Anandita. But there is uh, one question uh, privately sent to me. You just read the the in the chat first. Uh, please from Dr. Vidya first. It's okay. Is that the yeah, one of uh, the reversibilities in the structural changes in congenital glaucoma? Is that the question or congenital? Oh, sorry. Oh, oh, we, oh, we, the first one. No, is that the increased? Uh, increased severity of glaucoma, then the pressure gradient could also increase. Lower it should go, but how low? Yeah, so uh, that's a good question. And that's basically the problem with glaucoma. So I th there's clearly uh, the studies that have been done show that the lower the pressure, you need to lower the pressure even more in advanced glaucoma. For example, the uh, advanced glaucoma intervention study, the AGER study, showed that to get relative stability in advanced glaucoma, you need pretty much every pressure measurement to be below 15 millimeters of mercury. So that's really set the standard there. In practice is very hard to do. Uh, and even 15 itself may not be low enough. Um, sometimes, we, I mean, often we would like a pressure of 10 millimetres of mercury, but that's very, very difficult to do in practice, even with a drainage procedure. Um, so, and the problem is if you try, for example, a trabeculectomy with lots of mitomycin C, you can end up with very severe complications. Uh, the patients who you think would need a very low pressure, are, for example, the high myopes, but getting a low pressure and a high myope is also very problematic in that you're much more likely to get choroidal effusions and macular edema. So I think it's at the moment you, you have to strike a balance between the risk of doing damage by your treatment. So I still really aim for a pressure between 10 and 15. If I can get a pressure of eight in most people, I'm ecstatic, I'm absolutely delighted, but it rarely stays at eight. It often creeps up. If it's consistently around about 12 or 11, I'm very, very happy. Uh, but 
I, I don't believe even then that I've made the pressure, the pressure gradient normal again, but it certainly slows the disease down. Mm. So I haven't, haven't really answered your question, but uh, I think you just have to achieve a best compromise, but at least it gives you an understanding. The theory gives you an understanding as to why the disease can still get worse, even though you've lowered the pressure below the so-called normal average. Mm. So it means, uh, Prof, there is no uh, exact number for the IOP, Prof? for the for the advanced glaucoma i mean i no. mean it, it should be personalized something like that yes exactly personalized according to the risk of of making the pressure go too low um, and the other risk factors like if they're high myope um, even their family history probably there's genetics we have some patients who several members of the family are already blind, for example, from glaucoma, they're probably at a higher risk and their curve is probably already pretty steep. So trying to get those pressures down low seems probably helpful. Um, okay, Prof. Uh, uh, I hope uh, Dr. Vidya question has been answered. Um, do you want Dr. Vidya to comment about, his, uh, about her question, Prof? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, Dr. Vidya, you can unmute and then uh, talk if you have another question regarding this. Hello, Prof. Thank oh. you for your answer. Oh, my pleasure. Did, uh, did I answer your question, though? <laughs> I may not. <laughs> Yeah, I'm so I'm also um, familiar with ABS, uh, and that's why I asked actually because then probably we sh there's there's in a certain patient that we need to actually go lower, but of course, just like you said, sometimes it's just unachievable. Yes. And um, uh, some of the papers that I'm reading recently about progression, talking about corneal hysteresis. Um, you, what are your thoughts on it? Yeah. I think what you're saying is, can you measure properties in the cornea which reflect properties of the lamina carosa and yes. hence reflect that curve? I don't really believe that's true, unfortunately. There was the idea that there was a relationship between, um, for example, the idea that central corneal thickness, which people initially after the OAT study thought might, might reflect some uh, change in the lamina cribrosa, that's pretty been pretty much been debunked. There's no relationship histologically when you look at those measurements, or very little relationship. Also, the most of the effect of corneal thickness is really explained purely by the uh, change of calibration in the pressure measurement itself. So. I, I haven't seen any very convincing evidence regarding either corneal thickness or hysteresis reflect ah. accurately properties of lamina cribrosa, unfortunately. Uh, and also, uh, I hope it answers your question, uh, Dr. Vidya. There is a question, uh, the first question actually privately written, Prof. Uh, it's about there are some reversibilities in structure, uh, structural changes in, in congenital glaucoma after treatment. How can this be explained? Thank you. Ah, yeah, 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 yeah. So it's, it's almost, so the collagen in the lamina does change as you get older, it becomes less elastic yeah, and more yes. rigid. Uh, and it's got to do with the type of collagen in the lamina which changes as you age. So children seem to have more elastic type collagen. And so when you lower the pressure gradient, it's a bit like having a stretched bit of rubber, it then can bounce back into shape. And so you will get reversibility in the cupping, for example. There is some reversibility in the cupping, that is just the shape in the adult. So if you do HRT scans on patients before and after trabeculectomy, you'll often see that tissue coming forwards. So there is some reversibility even as an adult, but it's much more noticeable in a child, I think mainly because of elasticity. Uh, there's also, there may be 
some slight reversibility in the axons themselves uh, in children too, so uh, more so than adults. Um, the, the, the congenital glaucoma is a very interesting um, condition compared to adults. I think there's a lot more we could learn by studying that. And not only regarding the optic nerve properties, but also aqueous vein and connections to the anterior chamber and drainage as well. But that's a, a huge, a big topic uh, to look into. Yes, Paul. Is it the, the reversibility is also related with the, fun, the function, Prof? I mean, if it is reversible, then the function is also uh, uh, getting better? Uh, yeah, that's a very good question. Uh, classically, people thought no, but there is starting to be some evidence, even in adults. Well, in fact, it's from adults because it's hard to measure function in a child with precision that will allow you to detect a change. So no child is going to be able to do a, a visual field test until they're about five or six, you know, minimum age. And then they're well beyond having, you know, con presenting with congenital glaucoma. So you can't test that at the moment. And electrophysiology is not sensitive enough to detect change. So you can't really prove that hypothesis at the moment in a child. I, um, I, I know Anthony Clark, I think, is online. He might like to comment on that. He's got more ex recent expertise than I do in that area. Um, but in adults, interestingly, there is some evidence that there is some functional uh, reversibility. So some visual fields, some patients' visual fields can actually improve a little bit with reduction in pressure, for example. Now, it hasn't been published. I saw this at a conference two years ago it's very controversial because it goes against classical teaching, which says that glaucoma is irreversible. But there is some evidence from visual field tests. At the moment, it's unpublished. We're not talking about a huge improvement, but just a sort of detectable small improvement, basically. Mm, I see. Okay, Prof. The next question is from Dr. Anissa Wichaksono, Prof. Thank you. you. Were emphasizing, yeah. Oh, thanks. You were emphasizing the pressure gradient and the CSF gradient. Is there any cl any clinical diagnostic tool to measure this? Also, does a fluctuation of pressure affect the lamina cribrosa more? That's a very good question. Uh, unfortunately, the only way of measuring CSF pressure is a lumbar puncture or a drill in the head. We we and other people are working on. Uh, non-invasive techniques to measure CSF pressure, looking at their vein properties at the back of the eye. And some people are using ultrasound of the blood vessels in the brain as well. But at the moment, there's no technique to, so we can't do that routinely, unfortunately. I think it, it would help manage patients and also help predict patients that would more likely to get worse at the onset instead of waiting say two years with regular field tests and then seeing it getting worse. If we knew and could measure the gradient straight off, I think that would help us. Um, uh, now, the other thing you need to know with a gradient is the thickness of the lamina. We're almost there with some forms of OCT scanning, but not quite. But hopefully if the depth penetration of OCT scanning and the resolution improves, in the next 10 years, we may be able to image the lamina cribrosa much better than we can now. Um, and now your other question was whether fluctuation in pressure affects the lamina cribrosa more. Uh, short, I don't really know, actually. Um, th there has been some conjecture by people interested in this. We've debated this, but we don't have any experimental evidence, actually whether pressure fluctuation damages the lamina or not. Now, I'm going to venture that it probably does not. Um, and the reason I'm saying that is that years ago, we found that people who swim, do, you, do people in Indonesia swim laps of a pool for exercise? Is that popular, uh, Verna? I know some uh, people swimming. go swimming. 
swim, yes. They, they, they like swim. I think and, some people and, prefer swimming. And they wear those little goggles? Yes, yes, the goggles. Yes, bro. So now if you wear, wear the little tiny goggles, then most likely when you put those goggles on and you have the tight headband, the pressure of the goggles in pushes on the orbit and it, and it increases your eye pressure. So it increases your intraocular pressure. Oh. So, and it, we found this out some years ago, we did some experiments and it increases the, can increase the pressure a lot. And it only occurs while you're wearing the goggles. So that's an example of the pressure going up and down, so fluctuating. Now, David Mackey in our group uh, at Lyons uh, a few years ago looked at some veteran swimmers who have all be, been wearing these goggles for many years on and off, didn't find any association with glaucoma. So that suggested that fluctuating oh, pressure probably doesn't have that much effect. And there's another indirect, I've just slipped my mind actually, there's other indirect evidence that it probably doesn't. I mean, the simple fact is we can't measure the gradient, the pressure in the eye long term to know for sure. Now, I know what I was going to mention. There's a group in the United States, in Alabama, who have got um, transgenic implanted into the eye of monkeys and also into the brain of monkeys. And when they watch those monkeys during the day, even blinking, just bending around, looking up and down, you get very sharp rises and changes in, your, in the intraocular pressure in these monkeys. And yet those monkeys have got normal optic nerves without glaucoma. Almost certainly the same sort of thing is happening in typical humans. And so again, indirect evidence that pressure fluctuations probably don't um, affect the lamina or the optic nerve that much. It's sustained pressure. It's like a sustained force, just never giving up. Whereas if it's doing this all the time, you, you can use your elasticity basically, I think. So I don't have proof, but I suspect it doesn't have much effect basically. Very interesting question, very good question. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, the next is from Dr. Andrea Bro. Is there any, any way of measuring yeah. yeah, any way of measuring the thickness of the lamina other than postmortem? Uh, we've done that in pigs with the OCT scan. So the beauty of pigs is they've got very dense collagen in the lamina, which does show up on an OCT scanner. In humans, OCT scanning, you can usually identify the anterior border of the lamina, but not the posterior border. So at the moment, we can't do that reliably at all, unfortunately. Um, yeah, so, but as I mentioned before, hopefully in the next 10 years with OCT scanning improving all the time, perhaps that will be possible. Now, have I answered your questions, Anissa and Andrea? I don't know if you want. Okay, if Dr. Anissa or Dr. Andrea would like to comment about this, you can unmute if you want to ask. Yes, thank you, Dr. Firna and uh, Prof. Morgan uh, for your response. Um, it's uh, very interesting because um, I think I, I found a, a paper uh, before uh, that stated that the uh, IOP fluctuation actually uh, does um, relate it with the uh, glaucoma progression, which I thought uh, could be um, related to the uh, Lamina fibrosa uh, thinning. So uh, that's that's why I asked the question. I, I think I know what you mean. Sorry, what, the way you yeah. So IOP fluctuation can either mean short term fluctuation, like seconds or an hour, say half an hour or so at a time. That's what I thought you were referring to, or much longer term fluctuation. And the sort of fluctuation that some of the studies are measuring is simply standard deviation of the intraocular pressure measured at clinic visits. And that's usually what they mean when they talk about variation in intraocular pressure or I think what you mean by fluctuation. Now that is very significant, yes. So if you have, for example, in the AGIS study, patients who had pressures 
uh, most of the time less than 15, but some pressures greater than 15, for example, did significantly worse than those who had pressures always less than 15. Um, and other studies have shown that, so generally studies will examine a patient, say every four months and measure a pressure. After, let's say four or five years, and then at the end of that study, you'll calculate the mean or the average pressure and also the standard deviation. So that's the variability of the pressure. And that variability independently is associated with progression. So now I sort of don't think of that as fluctuation. I tend to think of fluctuation as being a short-term variation in pressure. I wasn't thinking about that's obviously a long-term variation in pressure. So. Um, so sorry, I probably got you confused by my initial answer there. Does that clarify things for you? Yeah, 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 it does. Thank you, Prof. And Dr. Andrea, do you have a, a comment about the, the answer, Dr. Andrea? Oh. Okay, so we will proceed with the next question, Prof, yes. from Dr. Arya. So that's Dr. Arya. Uh, I think this is the question. Yeah, Arya. Um, according to your data, should we start treatment earlier than usual for patients with risk factors without visual field loss or optic nerve excavation, since even mild glaucoma meant they'd lost around half the neuroretinal rim already? Yeah, so that's a, basically an age-old question. And the drug companies would love you to do that because then they could sell more drugs. And, and they push you to do it too. Um, it's it's just, it's a, it's a good strategy on their behalf. Um, it's not an easy question to answer I, because many patients will have elevated pressures for many years and never get glaucoma, whereas some will get glaucoma. And that's why the World Glaucoma Society changed the definition of glaucoma to being an optic neuropathy, classic excavation, visual field loss, uh, not necessarily dependent on intraocular pressure. It's to try and get away from that tendency for people to instantly put patients on drops if the pressure was greater than 21 or some threshold. Um, however, uh, you can, you're certainly right, and that's a, a problem for me as well. When do you uh, know, for example, that a patient is going down the path of glaucoma? And at the moment, the earliest sign is really the structural signs of looking for excavation. I think the safest thing to do is to actually look for change. So if somebody does have raised pressure, but their optic nerve is normal, let's say the pressure is less than 25, but greater than 21, they're a sort of low grade um, ocular hypertensive. Then I think all you really need to do is image those patients. So OCT scan, HRT, optic disc photograph, and then compare them at intervals. So you'll pick up a change fairly quickly if you're, for example, examining those patients once a year, if that's possible, and doing a comparison. Whereas if you put all of those patients on a pressure lowering treatment, you can calculate the numbers needed to treat before you actually uh, save one patient from missing their glaucoma. And it's a lot of patients. You'd have to treat, I think, the order of 50 or so patients before you tr uh, correctly treat one. It's, it's a lot. So it's not really worth it, actually, I don't think. Um, I think you're best off um, uh, taking baseline images and, and comparing those images. However, it all depends upon your perceived risk. If that patient has got pseudo exfoliation, if they're a high myo, then you might lower your threshold to start treatment from say, well, our, my threshold for an absolutely normal patient is to start treatment is around about 30. So if their pressures are 28, totally normal, I will sit on them. I'll see them frequently at the beginning just to check if the pressure's fluctuating. Um, if the pressure goes to 30 or above at any time, I'll start treating them. 
If they have a family history of glaucoma, I'll treat them if the pressure is greater than 25. If they have pseudoexfoliation, high myopia, I'll treat them earlier as well. Uh, that threshold of 30, I'm not very rigid on. So if I'm anxious or worried about them in any way, I, oh, actually I should step, I will use, I've got a computer program which calculates the risk based on the ocular hypertension treatment trial. Mm. You can, if you look at that paper, it's a pretty classical paper. I can't remember the author's name, but it uses central corneal thickness, age and intraocular pressure. And it gives you a percent risk of getting glaucoma at five years. Now it's pretty crude, but it actually then, I usually discuss with the patient, say to the patient, look, you've got a 10% or 20% chance of getting glaucoma at five years if we leave you with this pressure. Do you want to do that? Now, most of the time they'll say, no, I don't want that risk. I want you to lower it for me. So at which point I'm happy to give them drops. But, and that's generally when the pressure is above 25 or 24, I'll usually have that conversation with them. Most of the time they'll actually want me to put them on drops. And either way, I'm going to watch them relatively closely. Sorry, Aria, does that help answer your question? Please, Dr. Aria, if you want to comment about that. Thank you very much, Prof. Morgan. Oh, my pleasure. Yeah. Nice, nice yeah. to... Actually, uh, yeah, it answers my questions because I think we still have a lot of um, to look uh, after patients, a lot of risk factors, and I think it's a good idea to watch them intervally. Maybe each year we have to do perimetry or like OCT. And I want to ask you about, what do you think about the short wavelength auto method perimetry? Do you think it's more sensitive than the usual one, like blue on yellow? What do you think of it? Yeah, that's, a, we went through, there was a fashion to use blue on yellow perimetry about 10 years ago, and it is more sensitive. The, uh, the reason why we didn't do that was that it's not as good as for picking up change. So you can pick up earlier glaucoma, but then to monitor the glaucoma, you, it doesn't pick up change as well. So uh, also I think there was more noise. I haven't done one for a long time, but there used to be a lot of, I thought, artifact as well with the measurement. So. Uh, then we went through a phase of using the frequency doubling threshold perimeter, which also picks up, it was faster than blue on yellow. Blue on yellow took a long time, actually. So that was tiring for the patient. So that was a practical issue. Uh, the FDT was a lot faster and had about the same sensitivity as blue on yellow. Uh, and we did go through a phase of doing that a lot. Uh, but again, it wasn't as good as a white on white or standard automated perimetry for detecting change. So we've actually settled back on simply using SAP uh, and using, I think what's helped us is using optic disc imaging more because really that's more sensitive at picking up very early glaucoma if you're looking for changes in the optic disc images. I have tried blue on yellow prof for myself. Yes, make me dizzy, bro. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, frequency doubling perimetry is nice, bro, because it is very quick. Uh, I mean, fast. And then uh, if we concentrate, um, actually, uh, yes, for 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 um, like a small changes. I mean, an early changes. We could, I think, we could measure that. I know that Lions Eye Institute doing the screening for elderly using this. Uh, Frequency doubling perimetry, right, Prof? Because I have uh, joined one screening by the Lions Eye Institute. They use the FDP as the as the tools for the screening. Yes, yes, we we used to use that. We don't actually do the screenings anymore, actually. Oh, I see. The, the optometrists do so much screening for us. We didn't really need to do it. But yeah, yes. that was what we were. And the FDT actually. Um, was very good because it's a small machine and it yeah. had this sort of goggly effect basically. It was very good at in the uh, screening actually. Uh, 
So and it only took about three minutes per eye, I think. Yes, yes, and the three or five minutes. Mm -hmm. uh, and the next question, Prof, from Dr. Christian Gunawan, Prof. Oh, yes. I need your expertise. When we met a patient more than 40 years old, cup to disc ratio of 0.6, thinning rim, but has normal IOP and nerve fibre layer OCT and perimetry within normal limits, how should we manage the patient? Is it just observation or should we start treatment? Thanks. Uh, look, I, it's basically the same answer I gave Aria. I think you should observe the patient, but take images. So take OCT or HRT or photographs of that patient's optic nerves, if you can, and, um, and watch them over time. And you'll pick up the change if there is a change, because if the patient has glaucoma, it, it then needs to be progressive in order to um, be diagnosed basically. So just look for change. And if you don't have any of those uh, modalities, um, I mean, the old days we used to do drawings of the optic disc, which are still useful. Obviously a photograph though is, is really preferable if you don't have access to OCT or an HRT. Uh, and you can get those iPhone adapters, hopefully, which will Berner and I will talk about. Yes. I hope that answers your question. Yeah. Dr. Christian, do you have any comment about your uh, question? Oh, okay. Uh, if not, then we will proceed with the next question, Prof, from Dr. Maria Purba, Prof. Yes, now that is a very good question. And I meant to put an image into this talk. Um, and if you don't mind, I'm going to show you something which will help you understand the problems with myopia. I uh, apologize, I, I will show you this talk. Give me a second. Ah, here we go. Uh, Vern, I'm going to share screen if I may. Yes, I'll... please, Rob. Can you all see that? Yes, uh, we could that, see that. that that's a uh, swept OCT scan of one of my high myope patients. And what you'll see here is the, this is the optic disc here. This is the remaining nerve fibers going back into the optic nerve. The lamina cribrosa is very thin, like Joss Jonas's. You can almost hardly detect it actually. It was almost undetectable. And I, uh, this is the vitreous cavity here. You'll see a posterior staphyloma. See how it's bowed backwards. And there's almost no excavation or cupping. That's the bizarre thing. Now, if you look deeper, what you'll see here is the optic nerve, optic nerve here. And see how in the high myo, it's very much expanded. So it's stretched out and the posterior staphyloma occurs roughly over the area of the optic nerve subarachnoid space termination. So, uh, and it wasn't me who picked this up. It was a Japanese group who published several papers some years ago using swept source OCT, finding that high myopes with a posterior staphyloma almost always had an enlarged subarachnoid space uh, ending just under the sclera around the optic nerve. And it was like the sclera was being pushed into that space by the pressure of the eye. So in the normal glaucoma situation, the subarachnoid space is just this little zone here and the pressure is pushing the nerve into that space, as I explained before, and that's why you get excavation. In the high myo, the whole 
zone around the optic nerve, including the nerve, is being pushed backwards. And that's why you get a posterior staphyloma. But the nerves are still being crushed at the level of the lamina cribrosa. It's just that the biomechanics, the property of the optic nerve subarachnoid space is different. And it's kind of acting like a big sucker, pulling the whole sort of back of the eye downwards. And it's not allowing excavation to occur in the optic nerve itself because the whole thing is being dragged backwards. And it makes it very difficult to, to detect glaucoma. It's very easy to say that somebody doesn't have glaucoma in a high myope because you don't see excavation and cupping. But usually, if you look very carefully, you'll see just a very small step in, um, in the nerve fiber layer zone as the nerve fiber layer goes from retina to optic nerve in a portion of the nerve fiber. And then you really have to really just rely on your own gut feeling. If you think, if the patient's lost visual field, like an arcuate field defect or a nasal step, and you've got some nerve fiber layer defects, and particularly if the pressure is elevated, then it's probably glaucoma um, and you should treat them. Uh, but it can be very difficult. It's a, it's a very good question that you've asked. Um, and I, I hope I've answered it uh, enough for you. Do, do you want to make a, um, Maria, do you want to comment? Have I answered? Yeah, I, I think the other thing is you do need a low target pressure. Whether you need it lower than other glaucoma patients, the issue is what risk do you put those patients to by making the pressure too low? As you know, if the pressure goes well below 10, they're very likely to get choroidal effusions and macular edema. My target pressure with a myope is generally about 10. I'm frightened to go lower. Even pressures of eight, which in most people would be fine in a high myope can cause uh, significant choroidal effusions and problems. So you kind of Dr. have to balance the risk. Mm. Dr. Maria, do you, do you like to comment? About the no problem. Thank you for the explanation. Oh, my pleasure, Maria. Nice to see you here. Yeah. Uh, the next from Dr. Indra, Prof. Yeah. How, do we, how yeah. do we incorporate all of the available data to our clinical practice? Because many measurements, measurements done on the laboratory level are invasive. Yeah, that's a um, hard, difficult question. I, I mean, I, I, I can't really answer that one, except to say you have to do your best. I, I'm just hopeful that I've given you some kind of understanding so that when you next look at a patient, you're sort of thinking not just about what you can see, but also I'm trying to imagine perhaps the CSF pressure acting as a sucker and things being pushed back. It, I think it just changes the way you look at the nerve and uh, also assessing the risk factors for that particular patient, like if they're a high myope, et cetera. Uh, I think at the moment, that's really all that we can do. As things improve, then we may be able to bring some of these laboratory uh, understandings into better use. Okay. Dr. Arya, Dr. Inda, do you like to comment about uh, the answer? Um, uh, no, thank you. Um, that I think that's what we can hope in the future. <laughs> okay. And we have next question is Dr. Fatma. Thank you, Dr. Yes, Dr. Fatma. Yes, uh, is there any hope for bilateral buffalmos in a very young baby? Oh, oh yes, there is, um, and I'm sure. I mean, Vern is an expert at doing trabeculotomies. I know that. I've seen you do them. Um, and uh, so uh, that's a whole separate subject. And I, I think we could, Vern, maybe we could talk about congenital glaucoma in one of the lectures, one of these talks. Yes, uh, the next. The next, next uh, maybe. There's a, it's a really, as I said before, very interesting uh, subject. And basically there is, it's, I think the shortest answer is that in congenital glaucoma, practically speaking, it's either primary congenital where there's no other features wrong, it's just glaucoma, 
they usually do very well with any drainage operation, a trabeculectomy or a trabeculotomy or a goniotomy. Whereas the ones that have a syndrome or a secondary to cataract or um, secondary are much more difficult to treat. So the prognosis is not so good with those ones. But I think if you don't mind coming, we'll try and do a, a talk on that. And um, I, I think Anthony Clark, who was here, maybe Verna will try and persuade Anthony to help give us a talk. He's really more expert than I am. I, I've, um, yeah. Thank you for asking that question, Fatima. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Fatima. Do you like to comment, Dr. Fatima? Do you have any experience with this? Oh, okay. So we'll proceed with the next question from, from Dr. Fira. Ah, Fira. Hi, Fira. Yes, Fira and, um, so your, thank you for your compliments. Um, can I elaborate, you elaborate on the importance of CSF pressure and glaucomatous optic neuropathy. How do you find the role of ocular perfusion pressure? and blood pressure to the progression. Yeah, so that, I could have gone into that in more detail, but it becomes quite complicated quite quickly. Uh, and at the moment, there's not a lot of, uh, we can't do a lot about it. So just, um, so perfusion pressure is really the difference between arterial input pressure into the eye and the venous pressure going out of the eye. And most people have classically thought of it as being mainly affected by the arterial inflow pressure. Whereas, and the main driver there being blood pressure, that's why there's been a lot of, quite a lot of work looking at uh, blood pressure effects. And I don't know, I didn't actually talk about blood pressure, but if you have high blood pressure, it's it's actually slightly protective for glaucoma, but if you have very, very low blood pressure, so if your diastolic is less than 40 millimeters of mercury, you'll, I think your relative risk goes up by about two to three fold having glaucoma. So, but your blood pressure has, that's a very low diastolic blood pressure. It's actually very rare in patients to get that. Um, I'd say it's, it's less than 1% of patients would have that. So practically speaking, it's not that common. Uh, there's been some work looking at uh, nocturnal blood pressure changes in sleep apnea, for example. That work's very controversial. It's not consistent uh, and it's problematic because in fact, uh, what they're measuring is blood pressure at arm level but really what matters is the blood pressure at eye level. And when you lie down, blood pressure at eye level always increases by about 30 millimeters of mercury, simply because of gravity. And usually the studies that have been done don't take that into account and they're very messy. So most uh, experts don't view that evidence very strongly. So that's the arterial side. The venous side, is actually probably much more significant. And that's really the topic of a whole, I could actually talk for a whole hour on that easily. Um, the venous pressure increases in glaucoma. Uh, I didn't show you any of that data. We and groups from Germany and the United Kingdom have done quite a lot of work on that. And that's almost certainly much more significant in the average glaucoma patient than arterial pressure. So you saw those histological changes in the retinal veins. Now, patients with glaucoma get raised vein pressure that we can measure with ophthalmodynamometry. And that raised vein pressure tends to get worse or get higher uh, with worse glaucoma. So that will reduce the perfusion pressure. Um, I could, perhaps Verno, I could talk about that on another time if you thought there would be sufficient interest is the uh, circulation and the blood effects of, on glaucoma. So um, th 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 almost certainly that's an important factor. 
One interesting thing about the vein pressure is that if you lower intraocular pressure, over time you will reduce the vein pressure as well. And that's got to do with, we showed that in a paper we published some years ago, uh, it's probably because the insult to the vein is actually the pressure gradient down the lamina cribrosa. And by simply reducing that pressure gradient, you're taking uh, hydrostatic uh, force pressure off the veins themselves. So, and then you're allowing them to heal somewhat. So it's actually intertwined with the pressure gradient as well. So it becomes a complicated story. So in short, yes, the diffusion pressure is important. I don't think it's important in the way that a lot of authors think it is. The arterial input pressure isn't that relevant to glaucoma. It can be, but it's not commonly relevant. The, the vein pressure is more relevant and more important. Um, and and that's, it's quite an interesting story. Uh, Athira, have I answered your question? I'm not sure if I have actually. Yes, we are. Yes. <laughs> yes, I think you've already uh, answered the question. Uh, what I'm missing is the diastolic needs to be less than 40 for the ocular perfusion to be lower than it should be, right? Yes, um, that's actually very, very low, a diastolic. Okay. Effect. And, and it, 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 it's very rare for someone to have a 40 millimeter mercury uh, diastolic pressure. Uh, but uh, regarding the CSF pressure, mm. uh, it, it also has some optimal level, right? So not too high, not too low. If it's a bit too high as well, it could also uh, cause some nerve damage as well, do you think? Yeah, well, if it's too high, then you get papilledema and basically the effects of idiopathic intracranial hypertension. Yes. So that, that's kind of like the opposite to glaucoma, but having the same effect, but in, in an opposite way. Um, and sorry, the other... Having, now, having a low CSF pressure, it may not be as bad as... So, um, if you have very good buffering from the orbit and the pia mater, it may not matter that much. You saw the results in the dogs, whereas I lowered intracranial pressure, the retrolaminar tissue pressure reached a, a floor and didn't go any lower. And that was because of buffering in the orbit and the pia mater. But I suspect that in older patients, that buffering capacity reduces and so it's likely that the CSF pressure lowering then becomes significant. But uh, unfortunately, we don't have ways of measuring um, orbital tissue pressure in patients, and we can't measure and image the pia mater very well either. Okay, thank you, Prof. No worries. Nice to see you, Vera. Bernard? Uh, yes, that... I think you have. <laughs> Uh, answer all the questions, Prof. Oh, good. I, well, I'm sure there are other questions, but thank <laughs> you. It's been fun. I, I wasn't uh, sure. Um, it's, it's sort of complicated uh, information, and I'm so pleased I had all these questions because I think it means that many people found it interesting. So I'm pleased about that. Thank you. Mm. Maybe later on we could also like. Uh, how uh, related the talk with the like uh, um, how to manage the progression, Prof, for the patient, like yeah. the decision, yes, decision making and giving uh, the medication and also the surgery. Maybe it will be interesting, Prof. Yes. So like a clinical we, application. Yes. Yes. Okay. No, we can do that. The, yes. Uh, Bernard, perhaps you and I can talk about some topics we can write down. Yes. <laughs> so, Prof, uh, we 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 already, uh, I think, in the end of our Zoom meeting, uh, actually, in the peak, we have like 400 participants in this Zoom meeting. Yes, about 400, Prof. Uh, I th uh, thank you very much for all the participants, all the questions, and hopefully this uh, lecture will
give us more knowledge about glaucoma, more understanding as well. Uh, do you have any uh, like any um, like common for the last uh, the last minute, bro? No, I just wanted to say thank you for asking me to speak. It's such a pleasure to see you all, and and please stay well. So we're thinking about you here in Perth and hoping that COVID and other things are going okay for you. So it's great to see you all. You still have your practice, bro? Oh, yes. yes. <laughs> Too many patients. <laughs> Good, thank, bro. You. thank you. Everybody. We will end our session, bro. Yes, thank yes. you very much for uh, all the participants and also for Professor Morgan, which already give a, a like excellent and also fascinating uh, presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, we will end this session. Uh, hopefully, we could meet uh, in another session uh, in next month, probably, bro. That'd be great. Yeah, excellent. And if there's uh, if uh, there's any suggestion for the topic, you may talk to me and then I will discuss it with uh, Professor Morgan. Is it okay, Prof? Yes, that's a good idea. That's great. Okay. Thank you very much, all. Thank you very much. Uh, stay healthy. Uh, good night. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye, Prof. Bye, Prof. <laughs>